<laughs> Hi, Laura. Hello, Brother Schober. They're already asleep. <laughs> Welcome to Q&A for October. I don't even know what date it is. October 16th, 2020. Yep. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the delay. That's Hello. okay. Nice to have you tonight. Thank you. Nice to be here. Laura and I were talking to each other over the course of the week. She's deep. Mm, yeah. She's deep. <laughs> wow. Sometime we need to talk about some of the things you talked about. Mm. Okay. Not tonight, though. Okay, not tonight. Not yeah, you tonight. could you could always do a. Uh, Jackson likes to do like interviews with people, and yeah, he he does stuff with different people all the time, and it doesn't have to be a. A regular thing you know you can do a, a one-time special thing or if, if there's a if um you guys want to do more you can always do like several in a series or something so sometimes i alter the voices <laughs> yeah he he alters his voice and makes it sound funny yeah. oh okay well you've also jackson you've also like sometimes you sped up uh yeah you speed up the recording which doesn't Sometimes. really change how you sound. It just makes it faster. It's hard to get a voice to be unrecognizable. Because if you know somebody, you talk to them a lot, you know the particular idioms they use and the way they say things and accents. I don't know how they do it on TV, but uh, you have to apply different effects to it. And then usually you can still understand it. Well, the people who do it on TV, they, uh, they're they like professional actors. So they study and they practice. You know, that's the bulk of what they train for. Yeah, so right. it makes sense that they can do that. I've been listening to a lot of audio books lately, and I'm amazed at some of those narrators, how many different voices they can do. And, well, that's beside the point. You do pretty good, Jackson. I can do a few of them. Thank you. Coming from you, that is a real compliment. Shrumkoff, or what is his name? Yeah, Brother Shrumkoff. <laughs> he's real. Bogdan, Bogdan Shrumkoff. <laughs> he's not fake. I didn't say he's fake. That's your no. alter, it's your okay. alter ego. <laughs> when I start doing him, I just like I become him. It's a funny thing. It comes out of your mouth what you wouldn't expect. Oh, yeah, I like it. Uh, what does it say? He says, Big Mountain, Fallen Lake Erie, Devil Loose, <laughs> Buffalo, New York. Yeah, something Scorpion like that. Scorpion down your chimney, staying you for five months. <laughs> Worship One World Antichrist in Prison House. <laughs> Blue Herring. So, well, let's get started here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm looking for the questions right now. Well, I did want to just briefly touch upon the the Joel revelation thing. I just want to say uh, mm -hmm. what uh, Jackson and I were briefly talking earlier on Facebook message. And we, we talked about how, uh, how different prophecies sometimes are repeated in different books of the prophets. Uh, and you, you see this with uh, a bunch of different prophet books. Like there's prophecies in Enoch. You see some of the prophecies occur in many different contexts in other books. So I, I think this doesn't necessarily mean it's plagiarism. You know, some people might accuse the Bible writers of plagiarism, but I think, like I talked about in some of our teaching things, I, I believe in inspiration in a sense of inspired, like you inspire me, that type of thing. Where So I believe in divine inspiration so that the prophets may have been inspired by former prophecies and uh, they made new prophecies based on the older prophecies. I think that's not, it doesn't contradict them speaking in the name of, of Yahweh. So, uh, but I, I definitely think there's some connections with some of what Revelation says and some of what uh, you see in Joel and, and other, other prophets as well. So I think it's valid to make those connections. At the same time, we've talked about how 
we shouldn't necessarily assume that what one author meant is the same thing that the other author meant. They might be using the same terminology, but they might have had a different uh, perspective on, on it. So anyways, that's what I would say about uh, Joel and Revelation. Well, look at, look at Revelation. I mean, it's a compendium of Old Testament prophecies and people that are concerned about who the two witnesses are. All they have to look is in Zechariah. It tells you exactly who the two are. For instance, um, I think and in Revelation. what you said is true. But uh, you, people will take those prophecies that were written later on out of context and try to apply them to their day. I think that's only natural. Go ahead, so, John. What would you say? So I, yeah, I guess my question is, you know, the, you know, where is it that the people get, you know, I mean, you know, it's either Moses or Elijah, or it's Hanok and Elijah, Hanok and Moses, wherever they're getting, you know, there too, because even in Revelation 1, it, 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 it yeah. tells you, and these yeah. are the two, the word of Yahweh and the testimony of Yahshua HaMashiach. Now, I don't... They say Elijah and Enoch because supposedly they never died. Yeah. But okay. neither one that, of them that's where that comes. they didn't die. So that's where they get that from. And then I've also heard Moshe because he was the lawgiver, um, you know, and he would come back and give the law. Uh, I've, I've heard every, you know, mm -hmm. version of it. But when you see it, like you said, in Zechariah, when you see it in Revelation 1, I, I just was wondering, you know, because when Messiah said that even John the Baptist, you know, John the Baptist, I mean, uh, uh, Elijah has already come, you know, by being John. So, yeah. I think you find the two witnesses in Josephus, mm -hmm. and I think one of them is Jesus, son of Ananias, and the other one is James the Just. Right. They're both in there, and they're both very appropriate, <laughs> appropriately depicted in the Revelation. But, again, who knows for sure? So here's an uh, interesting take as well. Um, so, so you know how we all have crazy dreams, right? Um, sometimes we have dreams and sometimes we think, what does this dream mean? And um, so it's possible that John had some type of dream uh, where this vision uh, came from. And, you know, if he's reading from scripture, uh, he w he would be familiar with some of those prophecies, and then you know, how how our dreams work is our dreams can take things we've seen in real life and then recombine them. With our brain works in strange ways where it combines things in ways we can't control while we're sleeping. It just magically happens while we're sleeping, and sometimes we have the most amazing, unbelievable dreams. Um, so certainly. If John was reading the prophets, his brain while he was sleeping could have taken the different uh, messages and combined them together. And the way our brains work is our brains try to, our brains are basically supercomputers. And when we're sleeping, it unlocks a special potential. So it's certainly possible that while someone is sleeping, their brain could actually combine things in a amazing way that puts it all together in in a proper context and might bring new insight but that process could also like i said it could lead to a different interpretation than what the original writers of some of yeah. those specific prophecies were saying yeah um, i can you know with that dream thing that's that's exactly it's like it takes things that you know that your brain knows symbols that you know animals things that you know and it'll put it in a dream you know, and so, you know, in your current time and place, it seems that it tends to make sense. Or you might have something you might have a question about, but then it's revealed pretty quickly or, or, or sometimes a year or two later, you know, by learning and just you stumble across some scripture, you know, or what riding on a horse can mean and, and, and different things, you know, but just things that you know that you can associate with. And he, it's like he uses the father or the Ruach, or whatever, whoever's, however you're having these dreams, if it is, they say that it's like he's using things that you know how you can put in place and what you've heard even 
symbolically. And, and an interesting, um, like, uh, I forget who the composer was, but uh, I'm just going to guess maybe it was Mozart or so, someone, one of the, one of the composers uh, a, couple, a few hundred years ago or whenever they lived. And basically he composed songs while he was dreaming. He would dream and a song would come to him in his sleep. All the notes would be in his head while he's sleeping. And he didn't like, it wasn't like a song he heard before. It was completely made up in his dream. And then he woke up, he would wake up and remember the dream. He would remember all the notes of the song. It was, it was basically like a revelation to him because he didn't create it. His brain created it while he was dreaming. So it's kind of comparable, I think. Okay, well, if you're going to bring that up, I, I'd ask you a question. Sure. Do robots dream? No. <laughs> um, oh, and one other thing. The Book of Enoch has a uh, passage in the dream prophecies. I try to emphasize this to people because not a lot of people are aware of this. But basically... Um, basically there's a prophecy where in the dream vision Enoch uh, tells us that he and Elijah will come down right before the day of judgment um, or it doesn't say right before it says before the day of judgment they will return back to earth dwell among the righteous when the third temple is rebuilt and they will all be in the temple worshiping, worshiping Yah. Uh, that's that's in the dream vision of of Enoch. So I think uh, that some people believe that some people believe. Um, well, they believe the parables is of Christian origin, but the prophecy that I speak of is actually from uh, the dream vision section which is actually some fragments are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that corroborates it as a very ancient uh, portion of the Book of Enoch. But so that interpretation from the Book of Enoch seems like it's connecting the two witnesses uh, to Enoch and Elijah there. So maybe that's where that interpretation originates from. Um, maybe. But it, it could be coincidence. And maybe it's true that Enoch and Elijah will come, but that those aren't the original two witnesses of the original prophecy uh, in Zechariah. So, very uh, good. What's uh? You got another question? Oh or yeah. Question? I got three of them. Does anybody else have one first? Okay, these came in my email, of course, from this last month. Here's. A couple easy ones. First off, why is Moses depicted with horns? I think it was Michelangelo's Moses statue. Moses has horns. Uh, you want to answer that first? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, quick, I, I I'm, quick, I'm quickly looking something up about that. In uh, the Vulgate. The Latin, the Latin scripture by Jerome, he makes a bad mistake where it says Moses had radiance on his head, but Jerome wrote horns. And so when Michelangelo checked out that notice in the Vulgate, he read horns there. And so you might want to look at, might want to put in Google for an image of Moses with horns and see mm -hmm. what I mean. In fact, I could get one up here and show you. I will. But it's, I think it's pretty interesting. It says he had rays coming out of his head. Rays. So and, would, you, would you be able to explain... Um, Jackson, from your understanding of what you know, why that error came about, or you're not 
Yeah. Why that happened? Because Jerome was not a very good translator of Hebrew. That's why. And um, the Vulgate, Jerome, he, he translated in about the fourth or fifth century. And that's what he saw horns. And let me show you a picture of Moses with horns. <laughs> You've never seen it before. Aha! How are you sharing it with us? Sharing screen or what? Yeah, yeah. Notice the uh -oh. My, my uh, thing is not responding. Okay, there you go. Yeah, my uh, Zoom said not responding for a minute, so I was concerned oh, I was going to okay. get kicked off, but it's good now. Well, you see Moses with horns here, but somebody's coming in. But the original term, if you look it up now in the scripture, and I can't tell you exactly where it is, it says rays, like light rays coming out of his head. And Jerome, changing it from Hebrew to Latin, read that as horns. And that was the common reading after that. Until, I don't know where, the, uh, where they actually found out what the word that was translated horns actually meant. But I have read about this before, and it's supposed to say rays, rays coming out of his head, like light rays. So there's Moses with horns, like it? <laughs> I think that could be a Jewish trend. So I'm just trying to look, um, let's see here. Here it says why Michelangelo put horns on Moses. Let's see if I got that anywhere near right. So, which is the place that he mistranslated? What what uh verse? Well, we're, gonna, we're looking here. Because I have something to say about it, but uh, let me check here. Okay, Exodus thirty-four. Moses sits inside the church of San Pietro in Vincoli. Twisting in displeasure. All right. Why did Michelangelo put two goat-like horns on Moses? Um, I'm trying to get there. There's a lot of other writing here. Yeah. What about the horns? Scholars believe that this was a translate, mistranslation of Hebrew scriptures into Latin by St. Jerome called the Vulgate. I think that's what I said. It was the Latin translation of the Bible used at that time. Moses is described as having rays of the skin of his face. Jerome translated it to horns from the word karen, of course. Karen means a horn, like the end of Job. We've got Karen Hapo, yeah. which means like eyeshadow or some, a horn of eyeshadow. Yeah, so, so it's definitely a, a Hebrew. Hebrew to Greek. He wasn't Greek. just making it up. He, Hebrew he was Latin. basing it on an understanding. Um, but something to keep in mind is that uh, Septuagint also sometimes does some strange translations, but the Masoretic text also does some translations as well because they actually put vowel markings into the text and tell you what the words mean. And sometimes what they tell you the words mean is really weird. Yeah. Um, so all, all, all the different versions uh, have their own weird translations, if you will, or interpretations of these Hebrew words. The Samaritans have their own weird interpretations too. Um, so it's important to look at the differences in manuscript variants, but also to look at um, differing interpretations of the same of the same Hebrew letters. And there, I, I suspect that um, the word for horn and the word for uh, rays are connected. Um, 
you know, I mean, especially like if you have rays, like they're shooting out. So, and the horns are shooting out. So that could be one way that they might be related. Um, There's another one that really changes the entire meaning of the gospel that I was coming across today as I was writing a message for tomorrow. And that is in John 5, 20, maybe I can just look here real quick. Yeah, John 5, John 5, John 5, John 5, 20, 9b. King James Version says, those who have done evil resurrect to the resurrection of damnation. Other Bibles say to the resurrection of judgment. But the word there, Christus, doesn't mean either one of those. It means a trial. It's a legal term. And a trial is not necessarily damnation. And a judgment is not necessarily uh, a trial either. So. Well, I, I would actually, I, I would kind of lean more towards uh, judgment in the sense of um, like, uh, People have a negative connotation of, of judge, uh -huh. but uh, uh -huh. trial is part of the judging process. Yeah. And, uh, someone could be judged to be righteous, so I think uh, uh, judgment isn't necessarily bad. But damnation definitely yeah. s um, skews it towards a negative uh, understanding. Doomed. Doomed. And just think of the people that have used the King James Version for the last 500 years. What they're preaching from the pulpits, I don't know if you've been in church lately, but I have, and they continue to use that, the idea of damnation, that if a person has done evil, they're going to be re resurrected to damnation, but that's not what it said, but they use that as like a stick to beat people, wouldn't you agree? I definitely think uh, people um, misrepresent and, okay. Yeah, you know. I'm done. All right, give us another. Uh, All right. Well, or does hey, John? John? Wanna yeah, say uh, just something to kind of go piggyback off of what you were talking about between the Masoretic and the Septuagint. And this is something that I said a while back, and it's the difference between the Masoretic of Jeremiah 31 verse 8, and in the Septuagint, it's the same scripture, but it's in 38 verse 8. And I was wondering what you think about the the different translation of that you're saying why it's in a different order well not even just in a different order it's just completely there's a very big point that is brought up i suggest you look it up it's um it has to do with the gathering us from the north and the south and then it says in step two the feast of the pesach um and in the Masoretic 31 verse 8, did that is that nothing tune of that that was completely removed. So it's 31 8 in the Masoretic and it's 38 8 in the Septuagint. So we'll take a look at that. What, uh, while I'm looking at that, what Jackson will be the next question? So I'm looking next at Next question is pretty easy. That is. I got a point. I got 18 screens open, it looks like. Does the Bible mention Alexander the Great? That's a pretty easy one. Why don't you, uh, Jackson, uh, answer that it. while I'm right. looking at this? I think Alexander the Great is alluded to in the book of Daniel. There's a big horn and a little horn. And I'm just doing this from memory. I haven't looked it up or anything. The little horn is Antiochus Epiphanes, but the big horn is Alexander. Remember, it splits into four horns. One of those four horns is Seleucus. One of those horns is Ptolemy. One is uh, Antiochus. And I can't remember who the fourth is. So it's not mentioned by name unless 
he's mentioned because the city that was named for him is mentioned over and over again. That is Alexandria in Egypt. But he is alluded to as one of the horns, the big horn. Is that in Daniel 7? So, um, I would say, um, you know, me with, I hold to many other books as scripture. So, um, if someone says, is Alexander the Great uh, mentioned in the Bible? Well, all I have to do is look at First um, Maccabees chapter 1, and he's mentioned by name right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, I that this question you never heard of Maccabees. Yeah, most people are coming f from the perspective of uh, the traditional canon of sixty-six or whatnot. So, right. um, but I de yeah, Daniel definitely seems to be prophesying, or you know, as some believe, Daniel was mm -hmm. written after. So, whoever wrote. Book of Daniel, whether it be prophecy or after the fact, they would definitely seem to be talking about Alexander the Great and some of the prophecies. Um, where it starts to get fuzzy is near the end of Daniel's prophecies, where traditional interpretations are that it's talking about the Maccabees. Um, yeah. But there's... Um, they break down. Differing interpretations of uh, some of the final portions uh, because some of it seems to be talking about the messiah um and i have seen evidence that i've seen evidence of three different views of the end of daniel uh, like the fulfillment of daniel's prophecies towards the end and basically one is a sc the scholarly view which is it's talking about the maccabees the second is the messianic new you know christian interpretation that the anointed one who to be cut off that is talking about the messiah so that would be in reference to the 70 weeks okay so in other words the 70 weeks uh the scholars say the 70 weeks ends with the maccabees christians and messianics mm -hmm. typically say the 70 weeks ends with the messiah and jews typically say that the 70 weeks ended with the destruction of the uh, second temple in what I've seen some stuff about that so. yes exactly uh, Jackson didn't you say and when, when we were talking about that in Daniel 9 because uh, it just it says and we do, uh, which which part I was talking about Daniel 9 when it's talking yeah. about the Messiah being being cut off you know um, and when we look at that word it just means an anointed one so you know, and at the time, who was the, the Zedekite priest that was during a time of Antiochus that got cut off the yeah, last? Onias. Yeah, Onias. Onia. Onia the third. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if we look at it in that regards as well, um, because the word Messiah just means an anointed one. Yeah. At that, you know, and if we're going around that time of that, of that temple with what Antiochus Epiphanes and then and, and bringing in the what does it says and, and there will be a covenant made with many you know a lot of people say that's a this peace agreement and things uh, and the Antichrist will rise out of this but you know and but it was the new false priest they put in correct that yeah uh, changed, that, that yeah that changed uh, the you know cut off the the sacrifices that's so. right oh well, you everything in Daniel can be seen to have happened at that time. It's not a prophecy, it's an apocalypse. And there, an apocalypse tells you in prophetic terms what's going on at that time. A prophecy, on the other hand, starts with, thus saith Yahweh, and predicts the future. So you can go right down the line in Daniel, the prophetic portions there are apocalyptic portions, and you can name all of them, including that one I, I was talking about in Daniel 8, the, the broken horn as being Alexander. It works all the way until you get to that second apocalypse, 
with the one the one Onya was just talking about, with um, what appears to be a Messiah in it, and a Jew say that that is not a person, but it is the whole of Israel, Israel as the Messiah, actually of the world. I don't know about that. Daniel Boyardeen. He yep. just wrote a book about that, the gospel in the Old Testament or something. It was a good book, and it explains it that way. He's Jewish. You know, and then it, and because of the time that, you know, we coming out of Christianity, you know, where we were all kind of thinking, oh, well, that was, what, 400 B.C., B.C.E., you know, mm -hmm. and when we talk about what, well, roughly 150, 140 BCE, and that would be the time of the Seleucid Empire and all those things taking place. So it would make sense of the time of its writing through it for it to be more of an apocalyptic text. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly the same with Revelation. You can, you can trace that through Josephus from beginning to end. The only things that you can't very well see in Josephus are those things that Revelation tells you are happening in heaven. Um, so I'm ready to, to talk about the uh, Jeremiah thing. If, okay, good. Um, so, of course, it would require a lot more study from a uh, textual criticism perspective of, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing my version of the Bible. Um, so when I say this, I'm not, I'm not, uh, saying I'm going to do it one way or the other. I just say what my inclination is at the moment now. But so by looking at both verses, I'm actually inclined more towards the, uh, the uh, Masoretic version, um, the translation that, that we see. Um, but to explain the basis for the translation difference, um, you basically have the first, the first um, half is identical to the Septuagint. It's, behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth. Septuagint says uh, ends of the earth. Um, and then, then it starts getting different. So it says, with them blind and lame, the woman with child, uh, and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. So, and that's the, the Masoretic. Yes, yeah. that's the Masoretic. So the key differences here are there's a Hebrew word here, um, which let me see the pronunciation here. Um, I'm listening to, right now. I'm listening to the pronunciation. They say it's pronounced. Ever. That's how the Jews pronounce it. Ever. So the letters are ayin, yod, resh. In Hebrew, the letter resh is almost identical to the letter dalet, and it looks so similar that if um, it's very common scribal error, where the text says resh, but the scribe misreads it as dalet, or a scribe accidentally. Uh, writes it incorrectly as a uh, Dalit, or vice versa. The original text is Dalit, and a scribe messes it up and writes it as Resh, or reads it as Resh, because they were looking quickly and, and didn't didn't uh, notice the difference. And you know, some people, like, have you ever seen people in English where you were trying to read what they said, what they, what they wrote, and it's very hard to understand what they wrote, because they wrote kind of messy or cursive? And so sometimes some of the letters that they wrote look like it could be a different letter. That's exactly what happened in Hebrew for, for the manuscripts of the Bible. And one of the prime examples of this confusion based on how scribes wrote the letters was Dala and Resh. So Masoretic says Iver and Septuagint said, I don't know the pronunciation, but something like Avud, where it uses the Dalit, and that means unto, basically means like unto. So in the Septuagint, you see um, end of the earth to, or unto, so it's it's um, taking it as ud instead of ur, 
And then you have Passover, Septuagint, pa, uh, Pesach, um, is, uh, it means Passover. Uh, the Septuagint translated as Passover. But it also can mean something completely different. I'm listening to the pronunciation now. Let me see. Well, they pronounce, they pronounce it weird, but they, um, they pronounce it as Paseach. And that is a word you look, you look up in uh, Strong's uh, Concordance here on Blue Letter Bible. You look up and see where it is used to mean lame. And you see in Leviticus 21, for whatsoever man that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose or anything superfluous. And if you look all throughout scripture, it is used to mean lame, uh, someone lame. Um, and not in the modern English sense of lame, but in the older sense of lame, as in um, paralyzed or weak, um, weak to move. Uh, so it's it's crazy how the same word, the same letters could mean two very yeah. different things. Um, but also an important difference is uh, the Masoretic text has a wa or a vav, which is a and. It, it's, it means and. So it says um, uh, the blind and lame. But the Septuagint doesn't have the wa. It, it, it has unto pesha. So unto. So, 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 I, so I see. The word Pesach that we're thinking of and why it's being translated as Passover can also mean something as being lame or having an issue uh, physically or, or or whatever. And that's where that translation uh, kind of came from. That's, uh, that's where the, the difference uh, comes oh, from. That's, that's what I was, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. So um, crazy that these Passover can mean someone lame. Um, in a, in a, mm. in a context. And, you, and um, so that's not even considering which, ver which version is the correct version. You know, maybe the Septuagint is correct or maybe not, but both translations do work with that word without context. But with the context, there may be an indication which is the correct um, one. But the problem is they're very different Hebrew texts. The, uh, um, when I say very different, I mean there's slight differences that very much change uh, the context, um, like like wa being there versus not being there. That that'll change the meaning potentially. And then another one is um, it, it says, "And they shall beget a great multitude." Beget. Um, Let's see here. They shall beget. Uh, that that is the one that uh, it, Masoretic is translating it as her that travaileth with child. Um, and then let's see here. Yeah, so it, it's uh, definitely pretty close in terms of the, it's mostly the same Hebrew text that's being translated, but there was a few differences which led to a very different. Uh, interpretation. Um, but I, I believe personally that the overall context supports the Masoretic interpretation um, because um, at least from when I read it, the Septuagint version sound, it doesn't sound right in my view. Uh, it seems like it's like um, I'm not sure the best way to describe it, but it's like, uh, it's not clear why it's singling out Passover. Um, and also it, it doesn't make sense that it's going to the feast of Passover. Um, like they're gathering to Passover as if Passover is a place. Um, mm. but I wouldn't think you would, you would phrase it like that. I wouldn't think you would say you're, you're going to Passover. <laughs> Instead, you would think they would say they are um, 
celebrating Passover or something along those lines. So that, that would be my, uh, I, I'm leaning towards the Masoretic text, but I have a lot more work uh, to do before I fully do this uh, bioproduct thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm still going to be learning Hebrew more and I want to make sure. So I'll, I'll definitely be vi revisiting this verse and maybe I'll change my mind, but that's my thought. On it. But uh, yeah, very different. This could be a prophecy of Passover. So, you, you know, um, this could be significant. You know, how some people say, Variants in the Bible don't really change the meaning at all. <laughs> some, you know, some Christians will say that in their ignorance, but this is what, you know, this is an example where you could say if the Septuagint is the correct one, you, you could point to um, Christians and say, look, it, t it clearly says here, a prophecy, that Passover is going to be kept in the latter days. That would be a strong argument um, if the Septuagint interpretation is correct but if the masoretic interpretation is correct then there goes that argument for that particular verse so what you say the samaritan says is that in the uh, no uh septuagint it's not samaritan yeah but what does the samaritan say on that oh yeah samaritan only does the five books of moses oh, yeah, that's true. yeah so um okay. but you could look at vulgate but vulgate probably agrees with you vulgate usually agrees with masoretic text, mm -hmm. but you could also look at Peshitta, Syriac Peshitta, usually agrees with Masoretic text, but occasionally will have uh, agreements with uh, Septuagint. So that could be a fun little study. Yeah, and, and that those type of differences occur all throughout the Bible. So you could definitely go on uh, rabbit hole trails or whatever you call them. You could you could do that for like almost the entirety of Scripture. There's just so much depth to the variants. Right. Um, let me see here. Uh, Vicky just said, since the requirement was to go to Jerusalem, maybe this makes sense to say, I am going to Passover in Jerusalem. I would say that, um, it still seems strange to say it that way, but if we could find other examples like, I think it's important to look at Hebrew literature across the board um, to see how did they speak? How did they write? So if you see similar phraseology in other portions of the Bible or in other Hebrew literature outside the Bible, then you can say, oh, look, these people said in this other book that they're going to Passover. So therefore, that shows that this is a acceptable way to say it. If you can show an example like that, then that makes it a more viable interpretation. But if there's no parallels of saying it like that, you're going to Passover. Um, like, for example, um, if, if, if uh, you, someone, someone might say, I'm going to death. You're, you're going to death itself. But um, that's a strange way to say it. You would normally say, I'm dying or I'm going to die, but you would be weird to say I'm going to death. Like it, you see what I'm saying? So anyways, uh, that's my take on it. So um, what is another question, Jackson? The next one is a difficult question, but it's kind of inside knowledge. And uh -oh. that question is, where is the middle of the gospel of Judas? Now, in the Gospel of Judas, you've got the first part and then about 12 pages missing in the end of it. Where is the middle of it? I just found out where the middle of it was. I've never read this, read about this any place before. But I was talking last night to, uh, well, should I just ask you? So maybe somebody knows the answer to this. I shouldn't be so hasty. I have it right here. Okay, the, so what happened the, to the middle of it? See it? Oh, you have it. <laughs> <Nah. Good word. laughs> um, so what, are they saying that the middle is missing? Like, uh, in yeah, the, the middle copy? is missing. All they have is the beginning of it and the ending of it. There's 12 pages in the middle that are missing. And I found out the reason of the missing 
pieces of the Gospel of Judas from a. I was talking to a professor last night. They burned it for Judas. warmth. Huh? They burned it for warmth. Well, you're just about right. What happened was when they discovered the Gospel of Judas, the guy wanted to preserve it. So he put it in a freezer. And that dis disintegrated all but the top and bottom pieces of the Gospel of Judas. <laughs> She said, we had them all, but the idiot put them in the freezer and destroyed all the middle ones. So we I heard something that. different, um, not about Gospel of Judas, but uh, so that's cool. I didn't hear of that story. That's cool, though. But uh, I mean, it's not I just, cool. But it's I heard cool. that last night from a professor I was talking to. No, well, I never knew that. I read several books on the Gospel of Judas. I never read where those pages went. I thought they were probably lost somewhere in the past. But so didn't. I heard that some of uh, the people were actually taking some of the scrolls and um, like burning it in fires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe that, the, that was the Sinaiticus. Oh, that could be Sinaiticus, yeah. They, they um, burned off the last book of it, which was probably the Didache, because what was missing was just the exact amount of that. And when it was discovered, the monks there at St. Catherine's Monastery in Jerusalem, it was cold and they were throwing the sheets of the bottom of that text into the fire. <laughs> when Tichendorf recognized what it was, he's told him to hold up after that. So Sinaiticus, of course, is a oldest complete new testament that we have and it just so happens i have a translation of it if you want it i'll give it to you free just ask me for it it's a lot different than your regular new testament in that it, it came about early enough that it doesn't contain all the additions that catholic scribes put in after the second century all those passages about hell in the Gospels are all gone. They didn't take them out. They weren't there in the first place. Catholic authors put them in simply to have some, some um, leverage with the people. Do this or else you're going to hell. Um, Vicky's asking a question. Um... She's asking about what the document's called. I don't know what she means, though. What is it called? The document? The Codex Sinaiticus. Oh, okay. That's what I mean. I'll write it down here. Um, so, uh, also, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls had some similar stories of uh, people um, doing stupid stuff uh, and uh, causing some of the scrolls to be damaged and destroyed. Um, some people, uh, the early scholars who worked on the scrolls actually would um, would smoke while they were working on the scrolls. Um, so some of the some of the uh, the soot from the cigarettes would get onto the scrolls and thing crazy things like that, um, which caused some damage to some. There's a famous picture of John Strugnell sitting at a table with all these scrolls laid out with a cigarette in his hand with a big long ash on it. <laughs> crazy stuff. Crazy all right, stuff. now that's the end of my September questions. And uh, oh, one other thing, they also, some of the scholars, like they would try to open some of the scrolls of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and as they were opening it, there was this one scroll, I forget which one it was, but they, they, as they were opening it, it then broke into a million pieces. I'm, I'm exaggerating. It wasn't a million pieces, but hundreds of fragments. It was a per, it was an intact scroll. They were trying to open it, and then it psh, scattered into a bunch of small fragments. But luckily, because it happened right before their eyes, they knew, okay, all these fragments are from the same scroll. Because in other cases, they don't know whether the fragments are from the same scroll, and they do guessing games, and they try to take fragments and put them together like a jigsaw puzzle, thinking, mm -hmm. oh, this fragment probably lines up here. And sometimes they're lining up 
is questionable. Um, but people who read the Dead Sea Scrolls in the English translations, they are relying blindly on their reconstructions. And sometimes some of those reconstructions may be wrong. And, and they could be creating made up texts that never existed simply by putting fragments together incorrectly. So it's something to keep in mind when we're studying the Dead Sea Scrolls about how well, it's you possible. know the story of the Copper Scroll. What, what would that be? Tell, share. Oh, the Copper Scroll. They, they were simply stymied by how to get the Copper Scroll apart. And uh, of course it was made out of copper and it was all uh, had all kinds of green rust on it, and it was all rusted together. There's oh, no they, way they could. It, they split uh, it apart into different yeah. sheets. It, uh, John Allegro, who happened to be the only non-Catholic on the entire International Scrolls team, took it up to England, and they they did. They actually used a jigsaw on that with a very fine blade, and they were able to cut it into pieces, and then take those pieces take pictures of it, and then recapitulate it from that. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so you said we're done with September questions. We're done with September questions. Right. I can dig out some more if you'd like. So what would that be, October? Well, may, well, let me look and see. Maybe I didn't get them all. All right. There is a couple more. I'm sorry. Okay. How much older was Joseph than Mary? What's your view, Jackson? I think Joseph, first of all, nobody knows. I think Joseph and Joseph of Arimathea are exactly the same person. I have reasons why, but I'm not going to go into that. Mm -hmm. I believe Joseph was married in Egypt. I believe that James and Jude are older brothers and that they're twins. I have reasons for these Ideas. They're not just off the top of my head, but ideas that I got from researching. And so I believe that Joseph was quite a bit older than her. And that when he took her as a wife, she was, um, well, there are texts, there are texts to tell us that Mary was a, a prostitute but those are primarily Jewish texts. I believe that Joseph was an Essene and he took them in with his own children. So, um, Have you guys been, uh, sorry, have you guys been watching uh, my cam this whole time and it's been blurry the whole time? No, it's been good. It's been fine. Okay. Anyways, yeah. keep going, Jackson. Oh yeah, I was gonna take a, take a stab, yeah, that, because. You say Joseph of Arimathea, Arimathea, because where, where, I mean, where's Arimathea, you know? Uh, but it, yeah. when you discovered that it was seemed to be Ari Matia yeah. and Ari yeah. of Ariel the lion, you know, and to be in, you know, a position. So it might have been a Zedekite a scene with that title. And, the, and as you see, the tradition was to take in widows and, and others, you know, and take their children and even raise them. Uh, in the community, so um, very interesting that he could really he could be an Essene and and Joseph of Arimathea being Joseph Arimathea. Yeah, because there there's no Arimathea. Look on your Bible map; it'll show one down in the middle of the Sinai. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, but taking Joseph, first name Ari is the tribe. And uh, Matya would be the common name. And you look at the Jesus family tomb at Talviet, and inside there is a whole family of Jesus, most of them, in that tomb. But there's one person they don't know. But his ossuary is inscribed with the name Matya. I mean, it all falls right together, as well as the end of Acts 1, where you have two different candidates to take over the place of Judas, Joseph um, Barsabas, Justice, and Matthias, 
we have the same name there. Joseph Barsabas means uh, son of plenty. And justice means he was an Essene, a Zadik. And Matya, Matthias, is Matya. So Luke has to play a name games there, simply because if he gets caught as the author of that book, he gets the same punishment as the criminals in the book. That's why I am positive this is not the, the dear physician named Luke that wrote that. I'm, I'm pretty sure I know who wrote it. I won't give it to you here because you'll laugh me out, but um, he had to play name games, and there are many of them in Luke, people that you can identify in Acts of the Apostles that actually have either a different name or some kind of code name for who they really are. What do you think about that? Well, that's definitely um, a lot to take in, uh, but I'm, I know that uh, I know that that's your perspective. You know, you have a whole thing about Josephus and yeah. there's a bunch of material you have, but um, but it's understand, definitely... a person can say, no, that can't be right, but they don't know the research that went into it. Well, certainly, if you're going to, yeah. if someone's going to uh, say you're wrong, they, I mean, they could ignore what you say, but if they're trying to prove you wrong, That's a, good, a good way to go about it would be to um, look at your different claims and try to if possible, try to refute them. And if you can't refute them, then maybe you're right. You know, so it's, but it seems like such a big topic, like in the sense of, from what you've shared, it's, it seems like you have accumulated a big, a big argument, uh, yeah. which requires a lot of research to determine if it's true or not. And that's so, one of the reasons why I think people sometimes get astounded by some of these little discoveries, and of course they, they're brainwashed. They, they don't, they can't go past what they've been taught at one time or the other. And they don't want to wait around for an explanation. Not like John Ritter. <laughs> My uh, take on it is, of course, you know, I uh, hold a lot of credence to a lot of these apocrypha documents and so of course there's some new testament apocrypha documents which speak as to the uh life of joseph and there's two ways to approach it from like a origin perspective one these extra documents outside the bible they are um authentic and you know they they speak uh correctly about it that's one way to look at it the second way however is to look at it as this was uh, originated from theological beliefs so the idea is a lot of people question or at least a lot of scholars question uh, and people of other religions will question uh, that the Messiah was born of a virgin. So the idea that people say is that because the theological belief came into existence that that uh, the Messiah was born of a virgin, then these um, early believers or early Christians theorized in their head and they said, how could it be that um, if Mary was a virgin, that Joseph, uh, that uh, that he the Messiah could have other kid, uh, have siblings? How can this be? Because these siblings were older. The siblings were older than the Messiah, according to Scripture. It seems so. Um, how could this be? If uh, Mary was a virgin, that would mean that someone else had to be the uh, the mother of the siblings of the Messiah. 
So they, they, they would then have to come up with a story and uh, try to piece things together. There's two traditions of that. One is that maybe the Messiah had, uh, maybe uh, his brothers or siblings were actually cousins. That's what some, I think Jerome subscribed to that view. But then there's the other view, which is actually supported by Apocrypha documents, which is that uh, that they come from a prior marriage of Joseph. And we have at least, um, well, definitely at least two major documents of Apocrypha. There may be more actually though, but off the top of my head, I can think of two specifically, which say that it was that Joseph had other children to a prior marriage uh, and that it, that he was a much older man. So um, the two documents are the Infancy Gospel of James, also known as the Proto-Evangelium, which is, according to scholars, a, a significantly early document. They don't believe it was written in the first century, but they believe um, maybe second century or early third century. But I think, I think it's referenced by third century church fathers. So. So it's a pretty old uh, document. Um, I think it's mentioned by or Oregon. And then there's another one which scholars think is a much later document. I'm more inclined to think that there may be some authentic nucleus origin to, the, to this other document. And it's called The History of Joseph the Carpenter. Mm. And it purports to give sort of a testament of Joseph's... Uh, death where uh he, he gives a testament of, about his life comparable to the testaments of the 12 patriarchs where joseph is basically just telling about his life joseph in this document says that he sinned when he was a youth by eating unclean uh, unclean food uh from unclean animals and and other sins that he did um coincidentally it talks about enoch and elijah uh coming um and other things like uh death like it focuses on death because joseph's about to die so he's contemplating on the experience of death and it it shows a grieving grieving process of the messiah for his father so uh, and the messiah basically teaches his um, disciples about the death of his father joseph and gives some prophecies so um, i think there might be some authentic uh, origin to, to it, but of course some of it is scribal interpolation from a much later age. Like, like there's one interpolation in a document which says if anyone uh, writes on a piece of paper the name of Joseph, they'll be protected or something strange like that. And then it says anyone who names their son by the name Joseph, um, they will not go to hell or something like that. You know? There's things like that where it's clearly secondary to the overall core of the document. Um, but those would be, that's where I lean. I lean more towards those Apocrypha documents, which speak of Joseph living to, I think it's 111 or 110, one of those. Um, he lives pretty old and he is, um, he, he marries Mary when Mary is at the age of like 14, very young or something. Uh, so um, that would be my answer. Let me see what you guys said here. Even considering, I don't know if you you know the Pantera legend, some of you. Oh yeah. But um, the legend goes that well, I, it's hard for me to say that Mary was a prostitute, but that a centurion from Germany named Pantera raped Mary as a girl, which is quite possible, if she wasn't the mother of God, of course, quite possible because the centurions, they were rough killers. They, they took what they wanted, they raped and pillaged, in every sense. The, the way that centurions are 
presented in the Gospels, especially in Acts about 10, it's almost ridiculous. You know, the, the good centurion that uh, is going to give a lot of money to the synagogue, just that boggles my mind. But Jackson. anyway, she, she was raped and that Yahshua wasn't accepted very well because he was obviously um, half German. And they found the burial place of that Pantera in Germany, including a statue of him, at least half of him, half the statue was broken down. And they put that in its own little museum as the father of Jesus. So you can see pictures of that if you want, but the Pantera legend is uh, very prevalent among the Jews and more so today among the Caesar's Messiah types, the one trying to prove that Yahshua never existed or that he was, uh, his history and biography was all false. There's a lot of people like that today, including a lot of professors that use that legend. There's another document called the Toledot Yeshu, or the history of Jesus. It is, it is about Jesus dated about a hundred years before in the text, but the whole reason that Jesus came to be famous was because he learned the secrets of Egyptian magic and he knew the sacred name. And when he came into Israel, his intention was to make money with these tricks and to sell the sacred name to rabbis. That's the Toledot Yeshu, which you can read today. It's, it's the full story of that history, but to me, it's very sacrilegious. I, when, I <laughs> when you were talking about the pan, the panther, yeah. Pantera, um, one of someone someone was participating in our call uh, in in our meeting uh, by a phone number, and um, I don't know who it was because yeah. it, didn't, it didn't list it by name. But uh, as you were talking was, about it, they dropped was, out. That was Cindy Meek. <laughs> Who's that? That was Cindy. How, how do you know who that is? You know the number? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, so she man. Must have, she, must have liked, she must not have liked what we were talking about. <laughs> well, you can't get just hang up until the end of the talk there to hear what the people's opinions are. I don't think that we really know why she hung up. That's true. I well, could find be out for us, John, will you? See if she's mm -hmm. mad. See, yes. see, see if she thinks uh, Jackson's a heretic or something. That's why we have these shows, these opportunities just to talk about this stuff. I think everybody here that's been here is a, is a very strong believer. There's no reason why any subject would be off limits to us because we all trust our, each other as believers. Yeah, it might be, like Laura said, just uh, her connection cut off. You know, if, if, the Messiah, if the Messiah came today and he was some new age guru, wouldn't people write stories about him that weren't true? Wouldn't there become reeling out of Christian uh, publication companies all kinds of, of stories about this person? how they were a fake and not true and everything, unless they were all sucked in. Of course they would. Yahshua has a, a lot of bad press, let's put it that way. People that have tried to ruin his reputation and ruin the belief of those that have it today. So Jackson, um, on this topic, uh, we've talked about this before. Um, when the Weigels participated with us. I don't think they really participate anymore. Uh, but um, she's not allowed to. Oh, really? 
Um, well, you know, they've talked a lot about the virgin birth uh, and yeah. uh, how they're opposed to it. And at the time, I remember you saying something like, uh, it sounded like you were saying you believe it, you choose to believe it, even I though... I choose to believe in the virgin birth. Yeah, so my question is, do you still maintain currently, like, are you a proponent of... Do you believe personally that he was born a virgin? Or Absolutely. are you more... Oh, okay. I'm with you on that. I, no, I'm just Absolutely wondering your do. perspective on that. Okay. Although, you know, whether it, it seems possible or not, I have seen greater miracles than that in my life. Humans so, can do that now. Yeah, I, I was going to say from, like, I've tried to, I try to tell people who don't agree with the virgin birth that the problem is people have tried to make it so that only God could be born of a virgin or whatever. You know, they, they say... The fact that he was born of a virgin proves that he is God or divine or whatever. And I actually don't think that's the case because we have confirmed examples of virgin birth in the animal kingdom. There's so many examples of different, spe different types of animals. It's called parthenogenesis. You can look it up online if you haven't heard of it before. And you can look at all the different species that scientists have confirmed to be born of a virgin and not have a male partner. Bees, ants, birds of different types, snakes, um, different reptiles, and um, and uh, sharks, uh, many fish. Uh, Who knows uh, about wild animals? Say it again. Who knows about like wild animals? Who? Uh, well, in all those cases that I was talking about, they didn't. The scientists didn't make it happen. They uh, it happened naturally uh somehow and like in some of these cases they were like how could this be they they try to think they try to see if there was any other um like male partner in that facility and there wasn't so the conclusion had to be that there was born of a virgin mm -hmm. and then they would later do dna tests to confirm and they the dna test confirmed uh that that they did not have a a, a father so um, now, according to current science, virgin birth for mammals is more difficult to happen by nature um, because it, it's more complex and um, it doesn't seem to happen. And, but uh, if it did happen, they, they say that it, w it would only allow for a clone of a female. So they say that if a human was to be born of a virgin, they would have to be a female, and they would be um, a uh, clone of their um, of the mother. But so I, I used to say that I, I'm not really thinking of this anymore. But I used to say that it's possible that he was born with X Y. Uh, what was it? Uh, XXY syndrome or something yeah. silly like that. Um, but uh, I now believe, so who was it? Was it Lee who said his theory on um, the virgin birth where he doesn't believe he was human? Yeah. So when he first was telling me that, I, I was like kind of like, in my, I, I was just listening to what he was saying, but in my head, I was kind of being defensive. Like inside my brain, I was thinking, well, oh, that's ridiculous. That's, that's crazy. That's false. But as I thought more and like over time, my views have evolved. I actually lean more towards his view um, in the sense that I actually believe that the Messiah, uh, before he was born, was an angel equivalent to a watcher and that he descended um just like just like the watchers did came down formed himself into a man just like the watchers changed their bodies into a human form i believe the messiah changed his angelic body into a human form and then he entered himself into uh, mary's womb and that essentially essentially it was almost like in vitro fertilization where the Messiah um, 
was not actually conceived by Mary, uh, I don't believe. I believe that uh, Messiah did not come from an egg of Mary, that he just simply entered Mary's uh, body. And then I think he morphed his form to accommodate to the DNA of Mary. Uh, it sounds weird when I say it like that, but um, in the book of Tobit, uh, the archangel Raphael comes down and actually changes his body to form into a man that's a relative of Tobit called Ananias mm -hmm. or Ananiah in the Hebrew. Ananiah. He was, was an angel. Yeah, he was an angel, but he changed his body to be a relative, a blood relative of Tobit. So Ananias, as a, the angel as Ananias, he actually took on the blood DNA of Tobit's uh, relation. He actually changed his, Raphael changed his body to imitate a blood relative's DNA of Tobit. So in that line of thought, I believe that the Messiah uh, changed his DNA um, when he metamorphosized like like the watchers did and that he took on he copied the dna of mary and in that sense he is born of mary um and he was literally born through her through her womb and came out the normal way but uh, i believe that that has, was how he, she became pregnant with him that he mm -hmm. entered her through miraculous power. And I know that sounds crazy to other people, but the thing is the virgin birth, however it happened, is um, definitely beyond explanation with current science, so. Well, look, I just looked this up to make sure, but I think I've looked into this before. And if in a natural birth process, there are true hermaphrodites. And according to this entry, there are extremely rare cases of fertility in hermaphroditic humans. And it's known to occur in non-human species. Um, it's not been documented in humans, but then how would anybody know? All you would have to do in a hermaphrodite is have one tube going from one to the other or some accident or some purposeful self pregnancy, not saying that Mary was a hermaphrodite by any means, but it is a possibility. I think along the lines, uh, same as you, um, Monia, and I think that's pretty much sums up what um, Lee was talking about the very same thing. If a Nephilim can do it. Why couldn't Raphael do it? In Tobit. Right. Okay. Uh, looks like we're getting close to the end. Um, did someone want to say something about what we were talking about? Sure, we got seven more minutes. Speak up. Laura, you've got so much good input. <laughs> if you want to, you don't have to say. Yeah, you don't have to. Um, so now Melissa's not on the call. So um, I was going to answer her question. So I'm wondering if I should answer it or if I should save it for another time when she might be on. You go ahead and answer it because she listens to these online. Okay, so. I know she does, she leaves comments. So she actually, she actually texted me over Sukkot and she wants to get something set up in weekly, another Bible study if anybody's got time just to really hash out some scriptures, I guess. So I was talking to her about that. She should start her own. Yeah, she could. She's got to answer. And then, pe and then people could join. Um, so the question that she asked the other week was about the wineskins, right? That was, I believe that was the uh, question. 
and um, the interpretation. Now, I don't remember her interpretation specifically, but I look at it again, and I'm pretty confident of the interpretation. So to keep in mind, my interpretation is based on the Gospel of Thomas, and the Gospel of Thomas phrases it slightly differently than the regular Gospels. But I think the way Gospel of Thomas says it is superior. So I'm going to read it and then give you the interpretation. Now, in this uh, section, it has the Messiah saying like a, a few a few parables as a single uh, unit. It's, it's saying number 47. So it says, Jesus said it is impossible for a man to mount two horses or to stretch two bows. And it is impossible for a servant to serve two masters. Otherwise, he will honor the one and treat the other contemptuously. No one drinks old wine and immediately desires to drink new wine. And new wine is not put into old wineskins lest they burst, nor is old wine put into a new wineskin lest it spoil it. An old patch is not sewn onto a new garment because a tear would result. So some important uh, um, context here. It's telling us that all these parables are basically saying the same message. So let's go with the more obvious one. It's serving the two masters. It is impossible for a servant to serve two masters. Um, and what we know from that is that it's talking about um, serving righteousness versus serving sin. It's impossible for someone to, to serve both God and the devil. You can't be both righteous and wicked. Uh, either you are being faithful or you're being unfaithful. So along those lines, it is impossible, it's saying the same thing, impossible for a man to mount two horses. You either have to ride the horse of righteousness or ride the horse of wickedness. You can't try to ride both. If you try to ride both, it, it just doesn't work. Um, and the same with stretching two bows. The, the force required to stretch a bow requires it to be only one. Uh, and you can't do two. So with that said, what about this wine and the wineskins. So my interpretation is the uh, wineskins represents the body, our, our bodies, which uh, will be equ uh, equated with works, and the wine will represent faith, what is inside. So no man drinks old wine and immediately desires to drink new wine. So someone who has a uh, who has a sinful heart, uh, no one basically sins in their heart and immediately desires um, to be righteous. So, you know, if you if you're doing uh, if you're engaging in in something you enjoy a sinful pleasure, in the moment you are enjoying it, that is your desire. So no one who is sinning immediately wants to be righteous or is seeking someone who is seeking sin cannot immediately be seeking righteousness right after repentance requires a change of mind and you can't just change your mind after your sin one second later it requires repentance uh, your body to adapt to the chain to the uh cutting off the sin from your flesh and then uh it says um and New wine is not put into old wineskins lest they burst. So if the, when it says old, it's referring to um, like like Paul talks about the old man, the old man of sin. And so basically, the old wineskins is your your body being sinful. So you can't if you put faith into a sinful body, um, your body uh, will die. You will be condemned. Um, and old wine cannot be put into a uh, new wine skin unless it spoil it. So um, if you try to be righteous by your works, but you don't have faith, you'll be destroyed because you need, you need both. You need, it needs to be um, together. It needs to be um, the new wine in new wine skin. And uh, so that's my, interpretation but like i said the gospels put it a little differently and the way the gospels say it 
is harder to reconcile with my interpretation because I think I think it the gospels make it sound like old wine is a good is potentially good um, so but that's how I would interpret the parable based heavily on the gospel of Thomas being the priority uh, what's your guys thoughts that's Jackson good. you said you said amen yeah I say amen to that's good but in a purely biological way if you drink a bottle of mad dog you're not going to want a pepsi right after that you're going to want more alcohol because it makes you feel good it makes you feel good so let's see on that last chat um laura says I think you can, when and while you are sinning, you can come to the realization that you hate it. And you can change right then and repent. Very true. Well, so my, I just want to say quickly, um, I believe repentance is a lot more than deciding you want to change. Um, I believe, like, okay, so for example, if, um, if you... Uh, let's say you have an addiction to uh, smoking or drugs um, and you say, I want to quit. And then the very next day you go right back mm -hmm. to it. At that, t at that moment, you wanted to quit, but just because you wanted to didn't mean, doesn't mean you started to. The, the, the real way to quit is to begin the process of repentance. And part of that repentance process is, waiting it out and proving that you have changed you have to prove it and once you prove it then it manifests as true change until you truly change you can't be said to have repented because repentance is a change of mind and if you're still addicted to that you can't be said to have changed once you overcome that addiction you're no longer addicted to it so people who have become sober they're not addicted to it anymore. Like uh, people who are drunkards, alcoholics, they have to become sober first to have cha truly changed. Once they become sober and they're no longer addicted to alcohol, then they've been healed. They've been recovered. So they've truly repented. But you can't say one day, I'm going to stop drinking alcohol and, not, and, and now you declare yourself healed and, you're, and you've, you've repented because for one hour, you haven't drunk an alcohol. You've repented. It requires more than an hour. It requires you to prove it out and to show that you have truly uh, overcome it. That's my take on repentance. There is one contradiction. What's because that? Jesus sat on an ass and the fall of an ass. That's in Matthew. In Matthew, yeah. So... <laughs> question is, did he, did he ride both of those at the same time? All right. Time for us to go. Thank you so much for being here. And I had a good time. Hope you did too. We'll see you next week. Shalom, guys. Have a great weekend. Hey, by the way, Cindy's phone died. She just texted me. So. Oh, okay. okay. If you're I'm looking sure. for a service in the morning, see you at 11 o'clock Eastern time right at this same station.